to today's program entitled Spotlighting COVID-19 Supplemental Paid Sick Leave Mandates and Recent Developments. This session is part of CIFAR Shaw's guidance on state and local paid sick leave laws webinar series. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to the attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Josh Seidman. Josh, please go ahead. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are getting started with part three of our paid sick leave webinar series. Uh, part one, back in November, we covered a lot of developments in the state of New York. Uh, part two, in January, we took a look at Colorado and Maine and some more updates in New York. And now today for, uh, for part three, we have a lot of material to cover on COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave laws around the country. Uh, joining me for today's uh, part three segment are my colleagues Elizabeth Levy from our Los Angeles Central City office and Megan Tote from our Chicago office. Uh, you'll see, uh, I'm Joshua Seiden, by the way. Hi, everyone. Uh, as you'll see on the agenda slide, uh, please, uh, Kelly, thanks for the next one. You'll see we have, again, a lot of ground for us to cover. We're gonna start today with a nationwide paid sick leave overview um, take a look at the landscape as it stands at this moment and also a look back towards the tail end of last year. Um, there's been a lot of activity in just the last three months, a lot of which impacted this COVID-19 paid sick leave space. Uh, we'll then turn it over to a discussion on California COVID-19 paid sick leave for Elizabeth to give us all the updates that have been going on out west. There has been uh, probably no more active place uh, in the country in terms of paid sick leave, really paid leave sort of in general, uh, than the state of California over the last 12 months. Uh, then we'll come back east, take a look at New York. Um, there's been updates both in terms of Department of Labor guidance, uh, as well as uh, some new uh, COVID-19 vaccine paid leave that was just signed by Governor Cuomo on Friday, uh, went into effect immediately. So we'll be spending a little bit of time on that new development as well. Uh, then we'll turn it over to Meg and she'll be covering the Pittsburgh and Washington, D.C. landscape for COVID-19 paid sick leave, um, including some updates on the effective date in Washington, D.C. And then we'll round out the discussion uh, with a quick uh, look out um, in terms of where the space is heading in the next handful of months, what we're looking into our crystal ball, uh, crystal ball and seeing. Um, and we'll round out there with any time left over for questions. We'll also be doing our best to respond to questions throughout the day as well. Next slide, please. So to get us started, we're going to jump right into the nationwide overview. Um, this slide is one of my favorite slides to include in paid sick leave webinars. Uh, it gives you a, a nice, you know, quick one, one sn stop shot for what is happening both at the federal, state, and local levels for paid sick leave. So this is not just COVID sick leave, this is both general uh, and COVID uh, sick leave. And there's a lot of, of takeaways from this slide. So for starters, you can see in that first column, the total mandates. In about you know, the middle of December, three or so months ago, there were a total of 69 paid sick and, pay, and PTO laws around the country. Um, as of today, that number has dropped down to approximately 65, although the number is changing pretty much weekly at this point with certain COVID laws sunsetting and getting reenacted, these new COVID vaccine paid leave laws coming on the scene. Um, other locations like Allegheny County, uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, enacting a paid sick leave law that just happened last week, although we're waiting uh, for the formal sort of signature from the county executive. Um, but, but that one seems like it, it's basically intact as well. Um, so a lot of moving movement within the space. Uh, one thing that you might notice is that if you add up the laws in the federal, state, and municipal columns, they don't quite add up to the total mandates in that leftmost column. And the reason for that is that a number of these locations have multiple paid sick leave mandates in place. We'll be discussing a few of them today. Um, New York, for example, has both general uh, and, and COVID paid sick leave laws. Uh, so do Pittsburgh uh, and Washington, D.C. 
California has a, a whole big mess going on uh, with the general sick leave law, a supplemental sick leave law that sunset, but it seems like it's on its way back fairly soon, as Elizabeth will get into in a bit more. Cal OSHA's gotten into the mix. So uh, a lot happening there too. Um, the number not as important as just the, the speed with which the mandates are coming at us. Sick leave for the last six or so years has been on a steady increase. Um, as sometimes it's felt like an exponential increase, and that's really been the last year or so with these COVID mandates. Um, a few other takeaways from this slide. So, so number one, federal level, we have Executive Order 13706 providing paid sick leave to certain workers of certain federal contractors. Always worth keeping that one in mind. Um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or FFCRA, that mandate was around for most of 2020, but sunset at the end of last year. That mandate is not back, although the tax credit uh, option for covered employers, which is under 500 employees nationwide, was extended through the end of this month, back in, de in December, through the economic relief bill that was passed in late December. And then again, through the bill that was signed by, by President Biden last week, uh, that, that tax credit uh, option was extended again uh, through the end of September. And we'll also talk in a little bit about some expansion for the covered reasons and covered absences um, that employers who are covered by the FSCRA and who voluntarily choose to provide the paid sick leave benefits, again, no mandate, just voluntary, um, they can then go and get those tax credits for additional reasons than just those that were covered um, as part of the initial FSCRA. Uh, at the state level, 15 states plus Washington, D.C., We'll be focusing again, California, D.C., New York. Um, also, you know, just worth noting, don't forget about Maine and Nevada. Um, both of those are mandatory PTO laws at the state level. And then at the municipal level, a whole big swath of locations, 34 in, in total. Um, most of these are paid sick leave laws. Some of them are COVID paid sick leave laws. Some locations have both. Um, South San Francisco, California, is the, uh, one of the only locations in the country that has also passed a COVID-19 vaccine paid leave mandate that's currently uh, around and in effect. So uh, that's why that one was added to the list here. Um, and, and just as a, a quick shout out, the three locations in red on this slide, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas are, are added on this list, but those are all tied up in litigation. There was even a decision just last week on Wednesday on the 10th uh, that the Texas Fourth Court of Appeals affirmed a temporary injunction against the San Antonio ordinance, uh, deeming that it violates the state's minimum wage act and thus is unconstitutional. So it looks like none of those are gonna be going into effect at all, certainly not anytime soon, um, but still on the list um, for honorable mention purposes. Next slide, please. So as you'll see on this next slide, uh, this is just another way of thinking about the paid sick leave landscape. This is part of an infographic and interactive map that, that SciFarc rolled out in January of this year. It's really a helpful resource. It breaks down the paid sick leave landscape, both in terms of geography um, and in terms of uh, the, the nature of the laws, the substantive aspect of those laws um, in six different time periods from pre-2014 through 2020. It shows you the evolution from one time period to the next. There's also a ton of really helpful footnotes in the document uh, and, the, and the resource if you haven't taken a look for each time period, so there's a lot of notes there for you as well, background and explaining what's going on. Um, really helpful, and the link is there for you um, for your reference um, if you wanna take a look. Next slide, please. All right, so now pivoting to the focus of today's discussion a bit more, which is the COVID-19 uh, paid sick leave PTO landscape. As is the case in the sick leave world generally, there's no one single type of law, type of development out there um, one size fits all, that, that doesn't sort of exist. Um, but there, there are, you know, a few different high level categories that we can think about these developments. Number one, entirely new laws, executive orders, emergency orders, temporary supplemental orders, what have you. Um, that, that is sort of covers not just these COVID-19 temporary supplemental paid sick leave laws that we'll be talking about, but also some of these COVID-19 related developments like in Colorado, where there was a mandate for last year that has then sort of been converted into a public health emergency leave mandate that has no sunset date. Um, it also now includes things like the New York State and South San Francisco COVID-19 vaccine paid leave mandates. 
So it's a, a pretty broad umbrella term, but covers, you know, at least generally enough, multiple of these types of laws. Uh, number two, group number two, which is it's green and all these colors do, do mean something, by the way, as you'll see on the next slide. Uh, group number two, uh, amendments to existing laws or regulations in light of COVID, not a ton of those, but you'll see a few on the next slide. Uh, and then group number three are other paid sick leave locations that have not rolled out a new COVID-19 supplemental emergency paid sick leave mandate, but they have provided non-binding guidance on their existing state or local paid sick leave law in light of COVID. So expanding reasons for use perhaps, or adding some restrictions on documentation and so forth, um, all through non-binding websites, FAQs, uh, opinion letters, what have you. Um, so if you'll see on the next slide, each of these colors Right now, now it means something for this this landscape of COVID-19 vaccine, paid or COVID-19 excuse me, paid sick leave developments. Uh, 35 total locations um, that that we have have taken a look at here, broken down for you. Again, orange entirely new laws or executive orders, uh, green updates to existing laws, and that purplish bluish color, the non-binding guidance related to COVID. Some locations have multiple multiple types of developments. Um, you know, places like, like California, um, for example, have multiple types of you know, developments where there's guidance, plus also Cal OSHA requirements. Um, places like Washington, D.C., where there is a new mandate, but that new mandate was baked within the pre-existing non-COVID general paid sick leave law. That's why that one has multiple colors. Um, the green locations, right, where there were amendments to existing paid sick leave laws or regulations impacted uh, New Jersey, uh, Philadelphia and, and Seattle. Um, so uh, a lot of, of different uh, you know, derivations of how these mandates can pop up. Um, again, don't forget about that purplish bluish color right, that I mentioned. You can see about half of the locations on this list have that non-binding guidance in light of COVID-19 that is certainly worth taking a quick look at. Um, at SciFarth, we have a bunch of great resources, including a, a tracker that keep, keeps tabs on all of this. Um, a lot of our clients who've been interested in that have found it to be a really valuable resource. Uh, next slide, please. So as you'll see for the next two slides, um, we've been doing this as part of our last few uh, paid sick leave and paid family leave webinars uh, as part of our different series on those two topics. Um, we find it really helpful to roll out a couple of polling questions where we can about the locations that we're discussing, the scope of the organization, so we can better tailor the second part or the majority of our discussion based on those responses. Uh, so no right or wrong answer at all here, um, but if you're willing to, to volunteer, you'll see the results pop up in a couple of seconds on the right side of the screen. Um, so question number one, and there are two of these, uh, how many states does your company or organization operate? Uh, fewer than five, between six and 15, uh, between 16 and 25, or more than 25 states? All right. So uh, we have the uh, results that popped up and the overwhelming majority of folks here um, are falling in the more than 25 state category. It's really, really helpful, everybody. Thank you. Um, so that, that's question number one. And again, really helpful to know because we'll be, again, discussing a lot of nationwide overview topics as we saw a few slides ago as we work our way through today's discussion. Um, second question, also polling, no right or wrong answers. In which of these locations uh, does your company or organization have employees? California only, New York only, Washington DC only, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania only, uh, at least two of those four locations. So California, New York, DC, or Pittsburgh, or at least three of those locations. So um, that is, uh, all right, and we've got the results in. Perfect timing, Mike. Um, so you'll see the, the majority of folks have operations in at least three and perhaps all four of these, these locations. Obviously, two major states, Washington, D.C., and Pittsburgh, both major hubs for, uh, for employers as well. So really great stuff, everyone. Thank you for participating. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Elizabeth, as you'll see on our next slide, um, for a discussion now about California and all the fun paid sick leave activity going on at West. Thanks, Josh. I think that uh, when you describe California as a bit of a mess, unfortunately, I think that's a pretty pretty accurate description. Uh, we can get started and just flip right over to the next slide. So I, I think hopefully this is pretty old news for, for everyone here. Back in 2014, California enacted the Healthy Workplaces Families Act. Uh, it's basically the baseline for California supplemental um, or for California paid sick leave. 
and um, this leave this leave was one of the first types of leave in the in the country. And so I, I included the bullet points here. Um, these are sort of the major requirements for regular non-COVID related paid sick leave in California. Um, basically you're looking at three days there are different accrual methods you can have an hour for every 30 hours worked you can have a lump sum there um there are is generally a, a cap of accrual at 48 hours although as i'll mention in a minute there are some local leaves that can can change that the method of payment is either based on a regular rate or a 90-day look back um to one of the one of the things that is sort of much to many employers consternation both here and in a COVID context is the requirement that the bank of avail available leave be on a wage statement or separate writing provided contemporaneously along with the pay stub uh, reasonable minimum use is two hours covered uses it's not just the employee includes um the employee's own illness care for a child parent spouse registered domestic partner grandparent grandchild or sibling and as i'll get into in a moment there are some deviations at, at the local level with, with some of these things this leave does not need to be paid out at separation and if people are rehired within a year then the balance needs to be restored there are some some carve outs most notably in a in a cba context um, in, in certain capacities and the most important thing, you know, like I said, this is hopefully all old news for everybody, but this type of regular paid sick leave um, can be used for a number of different COVID related reasons. And as we'll, we'll flip to the next slide, um, you know, as we'll, I'll discuss in a minute, I, the, this non COVID paid sick leave formed sort of the, a bit of a backbone for the COVID related leave that although it did expire, um, it, you know, in its previous form, December 31st, as Josh mentioned, um, and as I'll get into, it looks like there's a, a very likely expansion on the horizon. Um, so just to lay the foundation in a non-COVID context, like I mentioned, there are a number within California, there really is a bit of a patchwork of a number of local California paid sick leave laws and ordinances. Um, you know, the details really, it, it gets pretty granular. Um, they mostly align with the state, but of course there are significant um, significant differences. So you know we've got Berkeley. Um, you know small businesses can cap accrual at 48 hours. Larger businesses have a cap at 72. That's different. Um, you know Emeryville, I just included the fact that it can cover leave related to guide dogs. I mean the the local the local peculiarities for some of these California leaves um, can, can really just be staggering. So if you have operations in any of these cities or counties, um, as we get into the other types of leave, you'll just wanna make sure that you're in compliance. We've got Long Beach um, and Los Angeles, there are specific hotel worker minimum wage ordinance laws that apply to specific industries. There's the city of Los Angeles that has a specific local leave up to 48 hours, employers can cap at 72. Oakland's leave is similar to the state, the you know same accrual method, but the cap uh, for small employers can be the uh, the yearly carryover is at 40. Larger employers can cap at 72. Again, these are just deviations from the state. Um, San Diego, San Francisco, Santa Monica, again, largely overlaps with the state, but not entirely. And you need to, employers need to make sure that you're complying with whatever is the most stringent. So you know the the big areas where you may see some some deviations are you know what's the diff what's considered a small employer versus a large employer or what exactly are the covered reasons are there you know maybe some of these local leaves have um you know coverage for sort of designated people and it's a bit fuzzy as to what that entails you know could that plausibly cover a roommate um the, ge the geographic boundaries are something to be mindful of, you know, is what's the baseline? Um, do you need to work in this specific city for a certain number of hours? Um, you know, the, the, the little, the, the devil's in the details and there are just, there are a number of very peculiar localized items that you need to make sure that you keep, um, keep in mind. And of course this all got infinitely more comp complicated once the COVID leaves started rolling out. Um, and so with that, we can flip to flip to the next slide here. So in um, in April of 2020, there was an executive order designed to cover food sector workers. 
and it was designed to close gaps left over by the Federal Families First Coronavirus Act uh, paid leave that was available under, under that federal law. And this executive order rolled out and, um, you know, like I said, initially limited to food sector workers, uh, largely mirrored the federal law in the sense that it was the 80 hours. Um, but the, the reasons for leave were a bit more narrow than the federal law. And then this seemed to be the backbone for the law that came into effect in September, which codified the executive order. It also provided leave expanded, it, it really greatly expanded the world of COVID related leave. It's not just food sector workers. Most employers with over 500 em employees um, were, were covered by this California. And again, it was fairly, it was still fairly limited reasons for leave. Um, so it was, you know, leave for the individual being subject to an isolation or quarantine order, a health provider requiring or recommending that they do so, or that the employee was prevented from working by the company for transmission related concerns. So if somebody, um, you know, it's, it, things like school closures, for example, were not covered under, under this California leave. And for the non-food sector worker portion of it, the same, the same wage statement requirement that you see with regular paid sick leave came into play. And you had a, you had a similar rate of pay um, as in the regular paid sick leave. It, it was tied to a, the pay period preceding the leave, which was a, a, a bit of a difficult thing to, to parse out, um, but largely based on the, the non-COVID related statewide paid sick leave. And, Something else, something that really I think caused a lot of a lot of headaches and a lot of issues was that the state um, published guidance that uh, on a number of different issues, one of which was documentation, and it explained that unless the employer had reason to believe that the employee was providing false information, that it would not be appropriate to ask for documentation. Um, I think the thinking there was to not create barriers for for taking this leave. It had to be made available upon written or or um, you know oral request. There's a notice requirement along with it. Um, you know, it was a pretty, it was a pretty hefty piece of legislation that came in, came in quickly, it went into effect immediately. It was part of the budget trailer bill, and a lot of folks were scrambling to to get into compliance, and you know, managed to get into compliance just in time for it to expire on New Year's Eve. Um, it was sort of interesting, for at least for for me, um, it was interesting. It was tied to the Families uh, First Act in the sense that this leave was set to expire along with that leave. And of course that leave really only was extended in terms of the tax credits. And so New Year's Eve, the, uh, the finally the state of California issued guidance that, that essentially said, look, we're not going to interpret what's happening at the federal level as something sufficient to trigger an expansion. So this, this leave sunset, December 31st, if folks were on leave when it expired, they were entitled to continue it until they exhausted it or no longer had a covered reason. Um, and that left a lot of people wondering what the heck was going to happen next and also left a lot of local counties and cities that had implemented their own leaves trying to fill the gaps. And we can flip to the next slide. So um, one of the other pieces, one of the other components for all of the things um, percolating in California is this Cal OSHA emergency temporary standard. If you're not familiar with this, this is another pretty pretty onerous um, temporary standard that the Cal OSHA division released and implemented. It came into effect right after right after Thanksgiving. Very very little warning. Um, there are a number of components. Um, I know we've have other materials, plenty of other materials, and whole teams of folks dedicated to to dealing with the you know the training component of this. Um, the testing components of this, this is a really, there, there are a lot of pieces to this, um, but as, as relevant to, to the paid sick leave portion, there's this earnings continuation obligation. It's not paid sick leave per se, um, and it, there's not, unfortunately, the extraordinarily clear guidance as to exactly what this continuation needs to be. The, the guidance suggests that it's essentially sort of the, the normal amount of pay that somebody would, um, would get, but this is a type of of pay that's available for people who are out of work for very specific reasons under this Cal OSHA standard. So if somebody is exposed to COVID at work um, or contracts COVID and needs to be out of the workplace, and it is more likely than not that they that they got it at work, 
um, then there's this earnings continuation that that is available to these folks. Um, the the guidance has been helpful. So Cal OSHA has continued to release guidance. Um, over time, it's sort of gotten a bit more helpful and explained that, for example, um, if somebody's on workers' comp leave or disability leave, they're not considered, you know, otherwise available and able to work, and therefore not eligible under this earnings continuation. Um, if somebody, for example, is unable to work due to symptoms, then they're not eligible for this earnings continuation. But that's a very you know, frankly, that's a very difficult fine line to walk. So Cal OSHA has released some some pretty helpful guidance on this front, but it's still there are still some ambiguities and still some things that um, that really require careful individualized case by case analysis. Um, so, and I, I think a lot of employers were possibly hoping for for a little bit of relief here. There were some some lawsuits about whether or not Cal OSHA had the authority to implement this, to implement this earnings continuation obligation. Uh, the Superior Court, I believe it was about a week and a half ago, came out with a decision that said, you know, look, we're not, we're not gonna grant an injunction. We're, we're not gonna be the first court to strike down this type of public health measure. Um, so for now, it's, for now it stands. And um, Cal OSHA has specifically said that they'll release additional guidance related to vaccines. So I think it will be interesting. I think that this this earnings continuation obligation could shift over time as you know people are either vaccinated or potentially have been exposed to COVID and maybe don't you know or already had it. Maybe their length of quarantine is different. Maybe they no longer need to be excluded from the workplace at all in certain circumstances. So. This is something that um, employers will just absolutely want to want to stay tuned on, and um, that we can flip to the next slide here. So, um, as I mentioned before, there were a number of local local level supplemental paid sick leaves um, in a, in a COVID context that we're trying. Some of these came out, um, you know, pretty early into 2020. Some of these were coming out later down the line some of these expired some of these ex expanded and it's been just sort of this this ebb and flow as um both the state and certain cities and counties seem to just be really trying to fill the gaps of um the federal families first coronavirus response act and just essentially trying to give people 80 hours for of paid leave for for certain covid related reasons um so out of all of these cities, as you can see from this this list, a lot of these places have their own paid sick non COVID paid sick leave laws, like Los Angeles, Oakland. Um, not all of them do, so I think it will be interesting to see, you know, once the dust settles, if um, you know if some of these cities will pick up the pieces in a post COVID landscape and decide to implement their own um, paid sick leave laws. But that that remains to be seen. So the the real the key takeaway for for all of these local leaves is that um, for now they've you can see the first few um, are tied to a period of emergency and then the next few are in effect for at least the next few weeks or few months. I suspect that some of the ones that are scheduled to expire fairly soon may be extended again. Um, the bull, I mean, the, the gist of all of these local local leaves is that it's it's 80 hours for full time, 40 hours ish for part time. It's usually a pro rata. Um, or I'm sorry, it's 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 a basically a pro rata analysis. So if you're working, you know, 20 hours, you're going to basically get a pro rata amount based on your normal hours and normal scheduling. Sometimes, again, it's very frustrating because there are often a lot of really granular um, differences between these these local leaves and the California leaves. So for example, um, you know, some of the Los Angeles leave covered school closures while some of the state leave didn't. So you just you you just have to really make sure you understand the covered reason, make sure you're looking at both the state and the city or county level. Another um I, I've done a, a ton of work in the Los Angeles sphere. So something something that comes up all the time is the fact that the city and the county leaves are different and the county of Los Angeles, and this comes into play too with the county of um, Sacramento, you have to really, you have to look at zoning ordinances sometimes and just really look at exactly where where on a certain zoning map 
locations are to determine whether or not these leaves apply. Um, so I just I just can't stress enough how granular the, the analysis is for figuring out whether these leaves apply to the business, to the covered employees, um, you know, and, and things like the rate of pay may be different. Um, so just if you have locations in any of these places, you'll just want to make sure that you're specifically complying with the local requirements. Um, and with that, we can flip to the next slide. So I think one of the uh, one of the big headlines here, as I mentioned, the there is this proposed revival of the California supplemental paid sick leave on the horizon. So after the statewide leave expired in December, everyone was wondering what's what's going to happen. Is the, is the state going to extend it? Will there be an executive order? And we we have at least sort of a, a partial answer. I I do not have a crystal ball, but the the legislation that's been introduced it's been amended a couple times um there's there's legislation pending right now it's still it's drafted as a budget part of the budget bill the same way that the previous one was so when it comes into effect it will it will come into effect immediately there will likely be you know a bit of a grace period to get up to speed and it's very similar to the to the previous california wide law but with some some notable expansion so it would be an additional bank of 80 hours for the calendar year so if somebody expired their supplemental california leave back in 2020 they'll have another bank of 80 hours available as of as of january 1st and you heard that correctly it's designed to be retroactive um you know i hopefully there'll be some some guidance on exactly how to go about implementing it on a retroactive basis but as of now it's it's drafted to be retroactive to january 1st um there are some changes you know proposed draft changes to the method of payment um it's the most current iteration was drafted to be the highest of either the regular rate or using a certain type of 90 day look back or minimum wage whichever is higher there's currently uh this was a, in a newer draft uh exemption for smaller employers so certain very small businesses may not need to comply with this and notably there's a an expansion to cover additional reasons so if somebody's out for um, experiencing symptoms seeking a diagnosis school closure kin care and notably vaccine rep uh, related appointments or symptoms those are now going to be new covered reasons so the much broader scope than that initial sort of narrow three you know those three reasons that were available under the previous state law um like the previous previous law the this the proposed draft is very explicit that employers can't require other paid um or unpaid time to be used instead of this supplemental covid leave like the other law there's there will likely be a notice requirement a wage statement requirement there will be most likely a way to offset leave provided under leave that is at least as generous as this type of leave so if employers um some employers have just been continuing to to pay paid leave even though even without a legal obligation to do so um there will likely be a way to, to take advantage of any leave provided under those types of circumstances um there there may in this in this newest version um that was published a, i believe a couple days ago there's a potential cal osha clarification regarding the earnings continuation the the guidance has been um has basically said that employers can require employees to use other paid sick leave to the extent permitted by law before dipping into this earnings continuation um which frankly is sort of confusing guidance and so this new proposed legislation will hopefully provide a little bit of clarity on that point and it's set to expire September 30th. Um, and so, you know, stay tuned. I do expect that this will come into effect, um, you know, fairly soon. Um, again, I don't I don't have a crystal ball. I, I sure wish I knew. I sure wish I knew if, uh, what what date it would come into effect and uh, what what exact uh, version of the legislation would be passed. But until then, the you know, stay tuned. And I know we you know will continue to publish alerts. Um, definitely have a team of folks on on top of this issue and with that we can flip to the next slide there's just um one more sort of little little cal peculiarity piece of of paid sick leave um legislation that that's been percolating so in in california um 
and on the west, a few other places outside of California, largely in California, we've had a lot of um, grocery legislation design, local ordinances designed for local hero pay, grocery store worker pay, um, some janitorial services are covered under this, but these have been popping up all over the place in California. Um, and it's just, it's very interesting. Los Angeles County, instead of getting the hazard pay, employees can choose to get paid time off that they could use for, for a number of different things that they could use the same way that they would use um, paid sick leave. Again, this is just the county. It would only, you know, only unincorporated areas of the county, but it's interesting. Hazard pay seems to sort of be sweeping the nation. It's a very hot topic right now. So, you know, if, if and when these, these ordinances are popping up, um, you know, outside of California, wherever you may be, may be doing business, make sure you take a look and see if there's anything slipped in there um, that provides a, a paid sick leave obligation. And as Josh mentioned, South San Francisco is really interesting. This one provides up to four hours of paid leave for vaccination, and it's it's actually paid leave at the premium hazard pay rate. So, um, you know, really interesting. It will be interesting to see how these these ordinances, um, you know, will need to merge with any California law that comes out. But it's just just something to keep an eye on as all of these COVID ordinances continue to pop up to just make sure that. Um, you know, make sure you're keeping tabs on your local jurisdiction. Make sure that if something includes a sort of sneaky paid sick leave obligation, that you're able to keep tabs on it. Um, and with that, I will I will pass the baton. <laughs> Great, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so, like we we said before, a lot happening in California. Um, trying not to be outdone uh, is the state of New York. Um, lots of COVID nineteen and regular paid sick leave activity happening in the state um, almost a year to the day, in fact, there's, there's been a, a real sort of major, major movement of sick leave uh, in the state. So we'll, we'll be covering the different elements of that over the next few minutes. Um, so for starters, let, let's, let's look at the non-COVID-19 paid sick leave standards uh, in, in New York. So firstly, uh, there is a statewide paid sick leave law, which is very briefly and at a high level summarized on this slide here. Um, we covered this in quite a bit of detail um, in our earlier segments of our paid sick leave webinar series. So uh, if you do have more specific questions about it, it's, it's worth taking a look there at those recordings. Um, let us know if you need copies um, or some client alerts that we've rolled out as well. <clears throat> to give you an overview though, so sick leave in at the New York statewide level uh, went into effect uh, back on September 30th of 2020 with use of accrued sick time beginning on January 1st of this year, so about two and a half months ago. Uh, sick leave accrues at a rate of one hour of sick for every 30 hours worked, uh, up to a maximum accrual cap of 40 or 56 hours, uh, depending on employer size. Um, the employer size determinations for New York State non-COVID sick leave and also the COVID sick leave law we'll be talking about in a few slides from now, um, doesn't have a specific calculation or formula. Um, it's not clear if you count all employees in the state um, or all employees nationwide. So that is an unclear uh, point under both of those laws at this time. Um, in addition and separate from accrual cap, there's a 40 or 56 hour uh, usage cap, as you can see uh, on you know, that, that third row there. Um, there's no waiting period on use, and that's a, a big update. So new hires accrue immediately, um, you know, one hour for every 30 hours work, and no waiting period on use. Uh, currently, the law is silent on whether there's any permissible cap on un, uh, unused time rolling over at year end, so no current cap on carryover. Uh, Front-loading sick leave is permitted, so you can give an upfront grant of your 40 or 56 hours at the start of each benefit year, but it's not clear if that upfront grant would allow a use it or lose it set up for year end. In other words, allow you to avoid the year end carryover obligations, even though the usage cap again is limited to the 40 or 56 hours per year. Um, so hopefully there'll be some guidance coming on one or both of those points, year end carryover or front loading from the state. Uh, there still are not final regulations yet. So, so keep an eye out for those. Um, the timetable is a bit murky for when the final regulations are gonna be published. There were proposed regulations published on the New York Department of Labor website a few months ago, um, fairly bare bones, um, covered a couple of topics, but not a ton of information there. So we'll see if the final regs uh, go any further. 
Uh, reasons for use, last point on this slide, um, goes beyond COVID, right? The non-COVID mandate, general illnesses, injuries to the worker or a covered family member, preventative care is also covered. So are certain FaceTime absences related to domestic violence. Uh, next slide, please. Also worth, worth a, a quick shout out here is the New York City Earned Safe and Sick Time Act, or ESTA. Um, ESTA was amended in September 2020 to better align with the state paid sick leave law, although it by no means is a mirror image of one another. They are, are still different in a number of, of significant ways. Um, but for purposes of this slide, you can see the accrual rate, accrual cap, usage cap, um, all generally align. Same thing with the no waiting period on use. The increased accrual caps and usage caps and the no waiting period on use, so the increases to the 56 hour mark, those were both new as of the amendments um, from, from September 2020. Now, the paid sick leave law in New York City and the non binding guidance uh, from the, the city both you know, say that one, that the law says carryover can be capped, and the non binding guidance say two, that front loading can get rid of carryover if you, you apply the right conditions. Um, so despite though the city law saying both of those things, the state law is still hovering out there um, in the background and unfortunately provides a more generous setup, the no cap on carryover and the, the no use it or lose it potentiality. Um, both of those are still in play. And as a result, you know, even though you're in the city where there is potentially different standards, the state law would in theory govern because it's more generous on those points. So, Waiting for some potentially updated uh, regulations from the city as well as the state. We'll see if either of those points are cleared up in the coming months. Uh, finally, reasons for use in New York City. Uh, Non-COVID, again, this is a non-COVID general paid sick leave mandate. Um, includes the same reasons as the state law, although a broader definition of covered family member and an additional covered reason related to PHG, which is public health emergency. Um, so, as you'll see uh, on the next slide now, so we're going to start taking a look at some of the COVID specific developments in New York State. March of last year, almost a year to the day, the state passed a New York emergency COVID-19 paid leave law. It deals with paid sick leave, but also expansions of the state's paid family leave law, statutory disability benefits as well. Uh, there's no sunset date on this mandate, unlike a lot of the other uh, COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave laws that are out, uh, out there and around the country, as, Eliz as Elizabeth uh, discussed in California, um, and as we'll be seeing for both Pittsburgh and Washington, D.C. in a few minutes. Um, so the non no sunset date is an interesting part of the New York state law here. The amount of benefits, um, also fairly interesting, broken down by employer size, um, with the lowest tier uh, group uh, getting unpaid sick leave, followed by uh, once the, the sick leave you know, is over, also uh, the employee can uh, apply for the expanded PFL or disability benefits. Uh, the second level, which are employers with between 11 and 99 employees, again, not sure if this is measured based on just in New York State or nationwide, there's no clarity on that particular point. Um, also for smaller employers that have a, a high enough net income, um, those employees are entitled to five days of COVID-19 paid sick leave plus additional unpaid sick leave if they need it for the duration of the covered quarantine or isolation. And then after that, they can also receive paid family leave and disability benefits, um, assuming they are eligible after applying. Now, the final group, the, the large employer group, 100 or more employees, those workers are entitled to at least 14 days of paid sick leave, plus, while not completely clear, it seems likely that they'd also be entitled to paid family leave and disability benefits. Um, for the, the covered reasons, which, which, by the way, as you'll see on that, that second to last bullet point on this slide, the covered reasons for paid sick leave here are more narrow than the covered reasons under a lot of these other supplemental COVID-19 paid sick leave laws. Here, the state is only covering absences for the employee where the employee is subject to a mandatory or precautionary order of quarantine or isolation issued by the state of New York other governmental entity, including the local departments of health that's related to COVID-19. Um, that, that is, you know, again, a more narrow uh, covered reason than a lot of these other laws that are out there. Um, getting the covered order, the mandatory or precautionary order of quarantine or, or isolation, and those terms, by the way, are defined by the New York State Department of Health. Um, getting that covered order has been a bit of an uphill battle for certain employees and certain uh, employers. Um, local departments of health, it seems to be the, the best way to go about obtaining that covered order. 
Um, the FAQs on the New York Department of Labor website also gives some guidance, albeit in the, the expanded paid family leave context, but we think it's generally applicable you know, and reasonable to, to apply in the paid sick leave COVID context as well, that if you can't get a covered order, you know, what can you do? You can turn to a healthcare provider um, and get a, a note from them that says certain things, including that you would be subject to, to the covered order. Um, the coordination of benefits point is a big one, has been thorny for certain clients. Uh, this COVID-19 paid sick leave is in addition to other accrued paid time off benefits, New York City, New York State, regular paid sick leave, other PTO, vacation time, personal days, what have you. Um, th this time would be in addition to, so they do not run concurrently, they do not stack on top of each other. Um, last point on this slide, the, the 14 days of paid sick leave, this is also uh, in the FAQs that the states released, are not 14 work days, right? They're measured as the amount of pay that the employee would be entitled to receive over the relevant 14 calendar day period. Uh, so just a, an important wrinkle there to make sure you're aware of. Next slide, please. So as you'll see uh, on this next slide, in January, in late January of this year, the New York State Department of Labor released some uh, non-binding guidance on this COVID-19 emergency paid leave law. Now this guidance, really important, even though it was only two pages long, it had a big impact on employers and their operations. Um, one of the big takeaways was that it, it clarified that this COVID-19 paid sick leave may be available to workers who are subject to multiple mandatory or precautionary orders of quarantine or isolation, albeit with some limits. Uh, essentially, what it all boils down to is the first order of quarantine or isolation, the employee can receive the paid sick leave, whether they themselves have tested positive for COVID-19 or they are subject to an order of quarantine or isolation due to close proximity, potential exposure, actual exposure, um, and otherwise unable to work. Now, the second and third orders, according to the, the guidance that the state released, will be available in terms of additional paid sick leave, an additional you know, block of, of five or 14 days of paid sick leave, depending on employer size, if the employee himself or herself essentially test positive for COVID-19. So the second and third orders would not be available to the extent the employee is not testing positive, right? In the event of a close proximity or potential exposure scenario, but they would be available if the employee tests positive either because the employee's initial quarantine or isolation period ends and they are still testing positive or because they are out on it and subject to a covered order, return to work, and then subsequently test positive for COVID-19. There's a lot of other information and content in this two-page set of guidance. Um, the, the other big takeaway is mentioned as subpart A on that last bullet point uh, at the bottom of the slide, which is if an employer sends an employee home where the employee is, is not permitted to work due to exposure or potential exposure to COVID-19, whether or not that exposure happened in the workplace or outside of the workplace, and the employee is not yet subject to a covered order of quarantine or isolation. The guidance says in those circumstances, the employer is required to continue paying the employee at their regular rate of pay. Um, the, the obligation would then cut off if the employee is permitted to return to work or they become subject to a covered order of quarantine or isolation. There are a lot of wrinkles with that pay continuation component of this non-binding guidance. A lot of hypotheticals, a lot of fact patterns, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, it, it, again, is, is a moving target um, and one that is worth thinking through in you know, combination with other paid time off programs that you offer, the state COVID-19 paid sick leave uh, mandate that we've been discussing, um, and, and other considerations as well. Uh, the guidance for what is worth also uh, does discuss documentation, um, as well as how to treat employees returning to work after uh, their, their quarantine or isolation period ends. Uh, next slide, please. So the newest uh, paid sick leave or paid leave component of the New York landscape is COVID-19 vaccine paid leave, signed into law by Governor Cuomo on Friday, on the 12th of March, uh, went into effect immediately, uh, has a sunset date of December 31st, 2022, so it will be with us for quite some time. Um, importantly, in addition to applying to public employers, the legislation calls for creating a new section of the New York labor law. Um, thereby you know, enforcing and being enforced against private employers. Uh, the, the act itself, the, the legislation itself, does not define employee or employer, 
but because it is part of the New York Labor Law Article 6, which does have definitions of employee and employer, both quite broad, as you can see from this slide, um, it likely ropes in a, a significant number of private employers, as well as a significant scope of employees would be eligible for the benefit, you know, not just full-time workers, it likely would apply to both part-time and temporary employees as well. Um, assuming they, they have a scheduled vaccine appointment, as we'll see on, on, you know, in the slide from now, um, for COVID-19 during their scheduled work hours. In terms of co collective bargaining agreements, to the extent you have employees who are covered by a CBA, um, a waiver is permitted here, but the waiver must explicitly reference the relevant New York labor law section. Now, if there is no waiver in place, then the vaccine requirement would apply. It would be in addition to other paid leave provided under that CBA. Um, now, there is a potential exception to the extent the CBA provides a greater number, a greater amount of COVID-19 vaccine paid leave than what this mandate calls for. Now, what is that amount? As you'll see on this next slide, the amount of required COVID-19 uh, paid leave here, vaccine paid leave, is four hours, a maximum of four hours per vaccine injection, right, for the employee to be vaccinated um, to, you know, for COVID-19. The amount, uh, again, the four hours per vaccine injection, so that can mean a few things. Um, depending on the type of vaccine the employee is getting, right, some of them require multiple doses, the employee could get more than the four hours, right? For vaccine you know, injection number one, they'd get up to four. Vaccine injection number two, they could get up to four again. Um, also, if any of the available vaccines today call for a booster shot in the next you know, you know, year and a half, year and, and, and three quarters or so while this law is with us, it is likely, although not clear yet, but likely that that booster shot for the vaccine would also be covered um, by this paid leave mandate. The rate of pay, the law says employees shall be paid at their regular rate of pay. They don't give any additional guidance beyond just that phrase, but that is the term of art that they use. Uh, coordination of benefits, similar to the COVID-19 emergency paid leave law, the benefits cannot be charged against any other leave that the employee is entitled to. Um, the law calls out the non-COVID New York State paid sick leave, but that likely also would apply to other legally mandated and company provided paid time off as well. Um, it's job protected, so no retaliation, no, no discrimination against workers who request or are out using this leave. Um, potential penalties worth also turning to New York Labor Law Article 6 for guidance on potential penalties that could come up to the extent an employer violates uh, this mandate. And open questions, there's a lot of them. Um, some of the big ones that we've been getting asked the last few days, is it retroactive to employees who've already received uh, vaccines you know, in, in previous weeks and months? Um, what about the type of notice that the employee has to give or the type of documentation that the employee has to provide? Um, and then what if I, the employer, already am providing some amount of COVID-19 uh, vaccine, you know, uh, paid time off to the employee? Does, does this run concurrent with that? Do they stack on top of each other? Those are just some of the open questions that are out there right now. Um, it, it is a moving target. We, we do expect that the state will be releasing some guidance on this mandate in the coming weeks, um, as it has done with the COVID-19 emergency paid leave law. So stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll take a look again at any questions folks send over if there's time um, or, you know, towards the tail end of the discussion. But, but for now, know that this mandate is in effect and it's here to stay at least through the end of 2022. We're awaiting more clarity in the coming months. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Meg to take us through uh, the Pittsburgh COVID-19 paid sick leave landscape. Great. Thank you, Josh. As Josh said, my name is Meg Toth. I'm going to be covering the last two sections, um, which include the Pittsburgh COVID-19 paid sick leave law as well as the DC law. And while neither of these laws caused maybe quite the headaches that uh, New York and California have been giving people, um, there are a few nuances that are important to understand, which we will get into. Um, so generally Pittsburgh is one of those locations that had general paid sick leave uh, prior to COVID-19. And in fact, coincidentally, it, it was enacted about a year and one day ago to the date. Um, and that's the Paid Sick Days Act. And then in addition to the general paid sick leave law, there's the COVID-19 paid sick leave law that was enacted last year to specifically address COVID-19 related absences. Um, and as you'll see, we'll get into more detail. Um, the reasons for use are very similar to the FFCRA. 
So on the next slide, we'll take a quick look at just the general paid sick leave law, uh, which again was enacted about a year ago to the date. Um, this law, like many others across the country, um, you know, it, it provides just general paid sick leave reasons for use. Um, and those for the, which I'll get into in a minute, but um, those uh, employers uh, that are covered by this law include any employers that are situated or doing business in Pittsburgh employing one or more employees. Um, employees who are eligible include anybody employed by an employer um, who, performs, who performs work within the geographic boundaries of the city of Pittsburgh, and it must be at least 35 hours in a calendar year. Um, the entitlement is a little bit different depending on the size, but employers who have 15 or more employees must provide one hour for every 35 hours worked, um, up to 40 hours, and employers with less than 15 employees must provide one hour for every 35 hours worked, up to 24 hours. Um, again, the reasons for use are very similar to some of the other non-COVID laws that we've seen, um, employee or family illness, injury, health conditions, et cetera, um, for closures of business or school because of a public health emergency, which is, you know, particularly relevant to COVID, but was, enact, you know, was part of this law before COVID was a thing. Um, and then it also includes care of a family member whose presence in the community would jeopardize the health of others, also which could sort of translate into COVID-related reasons for use. Okay, so then moving on um, to the general, or sorry, the COVID-19 paid sick leave law. This uh, became in effect uh, at the end of last year, so December of 2020. Um, it is set to sunset um, one week following the official termination or suspension of the COVID-19 emergency disaster declaration of Pennsylvania, so like at a state level, or um, the termination or the official termination or suspension of the COVID-19 emergency disaster declaration of the city of Pittsburgh, so whichever one of those is sooner. Um, and then this COVID-specific paid sick leave law covers employers uh, situated or doing business in the city of Pittsburgh that employs 50 or more employees. And the law is unclear if this applies, this sort of 50 employee threshold is within Pittsburgh or uh, measured based on the entire U.S. population of employees. So from a conservative perspective, you know, we're relying, you know, we're taking into, into account all employees uh, across the country because the law is unclear. Okay, and then moving on to the next slide. Um, employee coverage and eligibility. Employees who are eligible for COVID-19 paid sick leave uh, must have worked for an employer in Pittsburgh after December of 2020. Um, and they normally work for that employer within the city of Pittsburgh, but are currently teleworking, teleworking from any other location as a result of COVID, or they're actually working for that employer uh, in multiple locations uh, or from mobile locations, provided that 51% or more of such employees' time is actually spent within the city of Pittsburgh. So it's important to note that even if your employees are now teleworking from a location that's outside of Pittsburgh, if they were normally working in the city of Pittsburgh prior to COVID, then they would still be covered. Um, and then this law requires that the paid sick leave must be provided to employees immediately without any waiting period or accrual requirements once they have been employed by the employer for at least 90 days. Um, and those are the previous 90 days before taking leave. Okay, so then moving on. Um, in terms of the amount of leave, the Pittsburgh law is not an accrual basis law. The, the amount provided must be just lump granted to the employees. Um, employees who working full-time 40 hours or more a week must be granted 80 hours. And then employees working less than 40 hours will get an amount, uh, prorated amount based on the hours that they work, um, looking at a 14 day period. Um, and it can either be an average or what they're actually scheduled to work. Um, and then one note about um, this law in particular in terms of new hires, there is a caveat that employers must make the non-COVID, so the general paid sick leave, immediately available if requested um, for a paid sick leave 
reason um, that relates to COVID-19. So while there's a 90 day usage requirement um, it, or waiting period for general paid sick leave, and then a 90 day eligibility requirement for COVID paid sick leave, if an employee is newly hired and the need for paid sick leave arises out of a COVID-19 related reason, the employer actually has to immediately front load the non-COVID, the general paid sick leave amount. So that would be either 40 hours or 24 hours. So that's one of the nuances of this law that caused a lot of questions um, that people should be aware of. Okay, so then moving on to the next slide. Um, in terms of the reason for use, reasons for use, as I said in the beginning, these look very similar to the reasons we're familiar with under the FFCRA. Um, it is people are eligible to take COVID-19 paid sick leave if they are unable to work in person or unable to telework. So if they're able to telework, then they technically would not qualify. Um, and the reason has to be related to COVID-19, which includes um, a public health official, public health authority, healthcare provider, or employer determining that the employee's presence on the job or in the community jeopardizes the health of others because of their exposure to COVID-19 or because they have symptoms, um, regardless of any diagnosis. And the same qualification also applies for employees who must care for a family member. Um, there's no provision regarding what a family member is defined as under this law. Um, so we presume that it most likely just follows the Pittsburgh definition of non, the regular general Pittsburgh non-COVID-19 paid sick time rules. Okay, and then moving on to the next slide, the, these two additional reasons, um, if an employee needs to self-isolate or care for oneself because they're actually diagnosed with COVID, if they need self-isolate or care for oneself because they're having symptoms of COVID, or if they need to seek or obtain medical, a medical diagnosis, care, or treatment if they're experiencing symptoms of an illness related to COVID-19, they will be covered. Um, and similarly, it covers employees who need to care for family members for those same reasons. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Um, uh, la the last thing on the Pittsburgh law we wanted to cover was the employee notice and documentation requirements. Regarding the documentation, which we mean as uh, are employees required to provide documentation supporting their need to use COVID-19 paid sick leave. Uh, the law is silent in this regard. The best practice is for an employee, employers to develop an internal practice. Um, and there is language in this law that, uh, you know, talks about where the law is silent, then we would rely on um, a non-COVID standard. So for that purpose, um, we're recommending that people sort of follow the non-COVID paid sick leave law in, uh, in their requesting documentation to support the COVID-19 paid sick leave, which is three or more full consecutive days of absence, then you are allowed to request supporting documentation. And then in terms of notice, employees are uh, required to provide notice uh, to the employer of the need for COVID-19 sick paid sick time as soon as practicable. So a fairly, fairly standard uh, requirement in that regard. Okay, and then moving on to Washington, D oh, sorry, before we move on to Washington, D.C., I wanted to read out the CLE code, which is SS as in Cypher Shaw 3991. Again, SS 3991, and it is on the slide. Perfect. Thank you, Kelly. And um, okay, so moving on to the last topic here, the Washington, D.C. paid sick time, or sorry, COVID-19 paid sick leave law. And again, Washington, D.C., as many of you are probably aware, is one of those locations that had general paid sick leave prior to COVID, which is the D.C. Accrued Sick and Safe Time Act. Um, and then they also have, um, since COVID, enacted a COVID-19 paid sick leave law um, to provide emergency paid sick leave for COVID covers reasons that we're going to get into. Um, but first, we'll take a look at the general um, Washington, D.C. paid sick leave law. Employees are eligible for general paid sick leave, the non-COVID paid sick leave, if they spend more than 50% of their work time in D.C. 
or the employee's employment is based in DC and the employee regularly spends a substantial part of their working time for the employer in DC and does not spend more than 50% of their time working in any other particular state and the employee must have been employed by the same employer for at least one year without a break in service and they must have worked at least a thousand hours with the same employer during the previous 12 months uh, prior to taking the general paid sick leave. Uh, the coverage here it applies to any employer that employs any employee, so it's very broad. If you have employees in D.C., um, you should be very aware of this law. Um, the entitlement depends on the employer's size in D.C. If there are 24 or less employees, then you have to provide one hour for every 87 hours worked up to three days, which is the both the annual use and accrual cap. For employers with 25 to 99 employees, there is uh, the accrual rate is one hour for every 43 hours worked up to five days, um, which is again, both a use and a accrual cap. And then uh, for employers with 100 plus employees, this, uh, the accrual rate is one hour for every 37 hours worked up to seven days for both annual use and annual accrual. And then the reasons for use include both a sick time component, which means uh, leave for the employee for their own and for the care of a family member with an illness, injury, or medical condition, medical diagnosis, or to seek preventative medical care. And it also includes a sick time component where the employee can use uh, time for either their own or a family member who is a victim of stalking, domestic violence, uh, or sexual abuse where the absence is directly related to medical, social, or legal services associated uh, there with that sort of, any of those three categories of, of safe time reasons. Okay, so then moving on to the Washington DC COVID-19 paid sick leave law. Um, this was effective uh, April 10th, 2020, and the most recent amendments were effective on October 9th, 2020. The uh, sunset period is what is a bit of a moving target in the Washington DC law. Um, right now, we understand, um, although there are a lot of moving pieces, that the expiration of the COVID-19 uh, paid sick leave law is, uh, or, or at least this law is going to sunset when the COVID-19 emergency and the declaration of the public health emergency, uh, when those uh, are both expired, or on May 21st, 2021, whichever uh, comes sooner. And the reason we say there's a lot of moving pieces with this standard is because there has also been district orders that indicate that the expiration is going to be as soon as tomorrow, March 17th, or later this month on March 31st. However, yesterday, um, very timely, the mayor, uh, Mayor Bowser announced that the district public health emergency order has been extended to May 20th, 2021. So, uh, or, or around that time, it actually is a little bit unclear whether it's May 20th or May 21st. So now we understand that that is the likely expiration date or sunset date of this law. Um, however, you know, of course, if the declaration and the, the COVID-19 emergency is declared over before then, then that's when the law would sunset. But we have a feeling uh, given that this has, you know, there's been many amendments and many extensions that uh, it would be more likely that this, uh, the sunset date would be actually be extended uh, rather than end any sooner than May 20th or May 21st. Okay, so then moving on um, to the next slide, please. So for in terms of employer coverage and employee eligibility, um, any employer who has between 50 and 499 employees that is not a healthcare provider is covered by this law. Um, we, we believe this is likely to be measured based on the number of employees within Washington, DC, um, though the, the law is a little bit unclear in that regard. And then any employee is eligible who started working for the employer at least 15 days before the requested leave. So a very short waiting period for this law. Okay, and then moving on here in terms of the amount of leave, um, employers have to provide um, an amount sufficient to ensure the employee uh, who must be absent for covered reasons can remain away from work um, for, for full-time employees, two full weeks to up to 80 hours. And then for part-time employees, the usual number of hours the employee works in a two-week period. Um, 
this will never be more than 80 hours. Um, so that you, you know, there's no possible way that employers are going to have to provide more than 80 hours. Um, and it, we understand it to, uh, be concurrent use. Um, there's a, it is allowed to be used concurrently, um, with other paid leave entitlements. Okay. So moving on to the next slide. So in terms of the reason for use, now the reasons for use here are exactly the same as those set forth in section 5102 of the Families First Act. Um, so we have those on this slide here. I won't read them out, but one thing I did want to cover um, is that because of the uh, recent um, release package that was signed last week, even though the Families First Act wasn't necessarily expanded in terms of mandatory leave requirements, um, the expansion really has to do with the tax credits. There was actually an amendment to section 5102 in terms of the reasons for use. Um, there are new qualifying reasons for use under the FFCRA, which include that the employee is seeking or awaiting the results of a diagnostic test or a medical diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, it also includes if the employee is obtaining a vaccination and um, if the employee is recovering from any injury, disability, illness, or condition related to a COVID-19 vaccine. So again, the FFCRA was not amended to, to say that paid leave is required for these reasons, but if it is voluntarily provided for those reasons, then there is a uh, tax credit available. However, we're raising this with regards to the DC paid COVID paid sick leave law because the reasons for use in that law are directly tied to those reasons set forth in section 5102, which was recently amended to contain those three additional reasons. So we are predicting, um, but it is yet to be determined that there may be required paid leave for those three additional reasons under the Washington DC paid sick leave law or the COVID-19 specific paid sick leave law, that is. Okay, and last but not least, in terms of employee notice and documentation, um, for documentation, again, this means, can you ask an employer or employee to provide supporting documentation? Um, and the answer to that is an employer can, cannot require an employee who uses emergency paid sick leave to provide certification unless the employee uses three or more consecutive working days. Um, in terms of the timing of making that request, employers um, can only request that uh, supporting documentation be provided one week after the employee's return to work. Um, and there is an exception here. If the employer does not contribute payments towards a health insurance plan on behalf of the employee, they cannot require certification. And finally, in terms of notice, um, employers cannot require employees to provide more than 48 hours of notice of the need to use such leave, um, except in emergencies as provided uh, in this little note below on the, you know, the last bullet point on the slide. Um, employers or employees cannot be required to provide more than reasonable notice of the employee's need to use such leave in the event of emergency. Okay, so that takes us to the end of the DC section and I'm going to Flip it back to Josh for the last few minutes to um, tie out some general outlook and uh, talk about some resources the firm has to offer. Great, Th thanks so much, Meg. Um, so just for the last couple of minutes here, um, we get asked all the time, you know, what are you seeing? What's the landscape gonna move to next? Um, we try to include this type of slide for each of our, our webinars, um, upcoming developments, you know, obviously the COVID-19 paid sick leave landscape, there are scheduled sunset dates for a number of these laws, um, as we've discussed today, um, keeping tabs on, on what's happening in those spaces with extensions or sunsets, things that are tied to the FSCRA and the open questions that Meg just went over, all really important to pay attention to in the coming weeks and months. Um, will other states and localities start to follow the COVID-19 vaccine paid leave train, um, like New York, South San Francisco, um, you know, the supplemental California proposal that Elizabeth spoke about. Um, and then, so keeping an eye on those, those requirements going forward, um, this seems like an, another really hot topic that could take off at any minute. Allegheny County, uh, Pennsylvania had mentioned that we are just awaiting uh, county executive signature from our understanding, but that one has been passed by the county board. Um, that is just a general paid sick leave law that would go into effect later this year once signed. 
location is likely to adopt next, right? At the federal level, we have a, you know, there, there's momentum under the new administration for uh, a federal paid sick leave requirement. Um, as of now, the Healthy Families Act is the one that looks most promising, um, although it's still a ways away from, from getting close to, to being passed by the, by the legislature. Um, but it is one that is being thought about um, and considered. Um, it has a lot of commonalities with the executive order uh, paid sick leave requirement for federal contractors that we mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, states that are likely to, to see some activity, you see COVID-19 uh, paid sick leave developments likely in California. Um, Maryland and Virginia also are on that list as, as locations to keep an eye on, although the Virginia mandate and Maryland mandate, I believe both would have certain scope uh, limitations on their, their applicable scope. Uh, and then New Mexico, Minnesota, and New Hampshire, particularly New Mexico, that one in terms of a general paid sick leave law could be coming any, any week now. So pay attention to what's going on in New Mexico if you have operations there. Next slide, please. Uh, if you are having issues or challenges with keeping up with this, this landscape, uh, you, are, you are not alone. Um, it, is, it is difficult for everyone to keep up with the pace. We do our best here. We offer some resources to our clients, including a comprehensive paid sick leave survey, um, covers every COVID and non-COVID law out there. If you have questions or want more information, we have the paid leave at sidepark.com mailing list for you to reach out to, um, or a website, excuse me, to reach out to. And then we also have a separate paid sick leave mailing list where all of our client alerts and blog posts are, are posted and sent to. Um, so as we know about an update, you'll know about it too. You can sign up at that bottom link. It takes less than a minute uh, to sign up. So um, with that, thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions. We responded to as many of them as we could um, in writing. If you have other follow-up, please do feel free to reach out. Thank you for attending today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next part of our paid sick leave webinar series. Thanks, everybody. Concludes today's webinar. Thank you for attending.